Well, as you have noticed, we continue with our Grinchy theme as we count down these Sundays in Advent to Christmas. And today, I'd like to begin with a scripture that is likely familiar, something that we've heard before, but you never know when you listen with new ears, with you, when you listen with expectation of what you might hear. From the Gospel according to Luke, beginning in verse 26. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, How will this happen since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's Son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son, this woman who was labeled unable to conceive, is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me, just as you have said. Then the angel left her. Let us hear what the Spirit is speaking to God's people. One of my uh, favorite shows, like in my teenage years, young adulthood, was Friends. And my favorite character was Phoebe. Anybody surprised by that? I love Phoebe. She's just different. And, and she's smart, but in kind of surprising ways sometimes. And you just never know. You just never know what's going to happen with Phoebe. And there was this one episode I was thinking about um, where Phoebe was mad at Ross. And he did not know what he had done to upset her. And he was really distressed by this. He kept trying to figure out, why, why is she mad at me? Why? And, and he asked her, why are you mad at me? And she gave him the, well, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. And he kept pestering and, and, and you know, it lasts the, the whole episode. And, and finally... Finally, he begs her, you know, I, I want to repair our relationship. I, I would never do anything on purpose to hurt your feelings. So please tell me what I did so that I won't do it again so that I can try to fix this. And she breaks down and she begins to tell him about something he did or said. And then, um, and then you... And then the, the snakes busted out of your head, and, you know, 
that might have been a dream. Yeah, turns out the whole thing was a dream. She was mad at him for something that happened in her dream, but she was so sure it was real that she had held it against him that whole time. And that happens to us sometimes, not just with the, the dream thing, but sometimes we're just so sure that we're right, that we don't stop to consider maybe why or, or any of the other evidence or perspectives. And then we're surprised when we discover that it maybe really wasn't something worth being upset about or uh, so stubborn about and that we weren't right after all. In the part of the, the Grinch book that we read to the children a few moments ago, I was thinking about this part all week. The Grinch takes everything. I mean, we, we discussed maybe he has like, maybe there is a, a, a legitimate grievance that they have gone overboard or lost the focus of Christmas or let things get out of hand. And, and maybe if that were the case, then maybe taking the excess, the, the extravagance, might be understandable. But he doesn't take just the excess. He takes everything he can possibly take. He doesn't just take, like, the holiday food, the ham or turkey or roast beast or whatever. He takes every last bit of food. He takes everything from each and every house. Why? He doesn't take it because he needs it. He, he's not going to, to take it to a pawn shop and sell it. He's not going to benefit from these goods in any way. He, in fact, loads this all up on his sleigh and he takes it to the top of Mount Crumpet and it's on the very, very edge and he is about to push it off. He just wants to destroy it, to destroy Christmas. I mean, why, why take even their food, even the regular stuff, that, that can only be about sending a message, right? Something that extreme. The Grinch seems to be sending the message that Christmas is over. He is done with it. It is destroyed. And he is so sure that this plan is going to work. Now, of course, this is the, the plot device used in all of the movies and, and cartoons with villains. What's the villain's downfall? They get too confident. Right? That's always what happens. The, the, the Dr. Evil or the Joker or whoever it is, the bad guy, always gets too arrogant, so sure that they've got him this time, that they prepare some elaborate, you know, punishment or crazy thing that's going to happen. And just like that, the Grinch is, is about to push it off, and he pauses. He pauses for just a moment because he realizes that, that they all, they've, they've woken up, that they're, they're realizing right 
this very second that they've got nothing, that Christmas is gone and it's all over with. And he thinks, oh, it would be so nice to hear those wails and cries. And he pauses the classic overconfident villain pause. And it's in this pregnant pause that something happens. He hears a noise coming from Whoville, but it isn't crying. It isn't tears. It's singing. Christmas has come despite his best intentions. And because of that pregnant pause, a thought creeps in. Well, if I got rid of all of the Christmas things, everything associated with Christmas, and it still happened, the only logical conclusion is that there is something else, something more to Christmas than all of the things and all of the presents and trees and decorations and toys and the noise, 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 noise. And his heart grows three sizes right then. Sometimes it takes a pregnant pause You know, Mary took a pregnant pause when she finds out about this amazing thing that's about to happen, that she has got a big role in the way things are going to unfold. She goes to her relative Elizabeth. The angel has shared the news that Elizabeth is experiencing something similar, a miraculous pregnancy. And so Mary takes her pregnant pause and goes to Elizabeth's house. And the text tells us that when she gets there, she, she's greeted by Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, and before Elizabeth even knows who it is who's at the door, she feels in her body, in her womb, her child leap. And she knows that something amazing is happening. And she recognizes that the child within her has recognized the child to be in Mary. And Mary says this, With all my heart I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. He has looked with favor on the low status of his servant Look, from now on, everyone will consider me highly favored because the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He shows mercy to everyone from one generation to the next who honors him as God. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He has pulled down, the, he has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty handed. 
He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy, just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to Abraham's descendants forever. That poem, or maybe you would even call it a a prophecy, it is in the traditional form of a prophet. This prophecy that she brings is, um, has often become known as the Magnificat. That's because in the Latin translation, the Latin version of the text, Magnificat is the first word of that poem. And I love this poem, this great word that she brings from God about how God is going to set everything right. That this is just the beginning, choosing her and the son that she carries will change everything, will fix everything. There's a part of me that really likes part of this poem, especially the part about the the powerful being brought low and the low lifted up. You know, the tables are turned. And the many times I have read and studied this passage, many, many times, I have preached this passage many, many times I have read and studied this passage uncountable number of times. And last night, just last night, when I thought I had everything else ready to go and I should be done, I decided to take a pregnant pause Okay, what's the new thing, God? What what do I need to hear? What do I need to say? And I landed on He shows mercy to everyone. And it occurred to me for the first time that I had thought of that poem as stating, here are the, the, the people that God is going to give good things to these people and God is going to give punishment to these people. But it's not. Because God gives to each what is merciful and what we need. So some of it's obvious. The hungry need to be filled with good things. And sometimes the rich need to be sent away empty-handed. Not as punishment, but because that's what they need. That, however it works, those are all blessings. Those are all, those are all gifts from God. God gives us what we need. Sometimes we need stuff, sometimes we need less stuff. Sometimes we need to be lifted up. Sometimes we need to be reminded we are not as high as we think we are. God gives us what we need. And it's that pregnant pause, that pregnant pause that that somehow makes room 
for the transformation. Whether it's the moment we get so sure we're right, so confident that everybody else is wrong, that we pause to relish in our victory. Or sometimes it's just that pregnant pause when we're digesting some information and we don't know quite where to go from here. Taking a pregnant pause is an opportunity for God to work some transformation. Maybe it's just long enough for another thought to creep into our head and show us something new, something we need. That is my prayer for you this week, that you have an opportunity in this season of busyness in the preparations and the craziness and the packing and the cooking and the baking and the cleaning. Sometimes the cleaning of the cooking and the baking and the, and the doing of the cooking and the baking again. Um, however it works out for you in your house, I hope that you take a pregnant pause and hear something, receive something that you need. Thank you again for being here this morning in worship with us. We are so glad to have all of you here, all of you joining online. You are part of this congregation as well. And it is so good when we worship God together. God can do all kinds of things in that space. And if perhaps you have felt a, uh, a nudge or are wondering if there's something more that God has in mind for you, if you'd like to visit with me about that and discern what that might be, I would love to help you. Uh, my information is uh, right under those prayer requests that we looked at earlier, and feel free to call or text or uh, send me an email. And let me know how I can support you in that. Um, or um, if you would like, uh, if you're ready to share a decision this morning, whether to accept Christ for the first time or reaffirm your faith or take a, a new step in joining this faith community, then I would love it if you would come and share that with me. Uh, let us all stand and lift our voices once more before we go.
Thank you for beginning your week in worship with us. I hope that you have had a meaningful time of worship here this morning and that you go in peace and expect a pregnant pause this week to remind you or bring you something that you need. Go in peace. <laughs> 